morning, this is Mike Barry at Insurance Information Institute TV, and I've got with me Kenneth Feinberg, who is the author of the just published Who Gets What? And first off, uh, welcome, Kenneth. Uh, glad you made some time to be with us. Uh, a lot of uh, interesting input here, and I, let me first show our uh, viewers the, the cover of the book. It's coming out nationally tomorrow, June, uh, June 26th, Who Gets What? And uh, Kenneth Feinberg is probably going to be a very familiar face to a lot of our viewers as the uh, special master for 9-11 and also about the Gulf Coast Claims Facility. But I, I think uh, we're based in New York and we're not far from 9-11, so where were you on 9-11? 9-11, I was teaching a class at the University of Pennsylvania Law School in Philadelphia. Okay. And I came out of the class at around 9 a.m. It was an early a.m. class. And I saw uh, in the student union, uh, everybody watching TV, I thought it was a you know, an errant plane that had hit the building. I got as far on the train coming back to Washington. I got as far as Wilmington, Delaware, when the other plane hit the Pentagon. That was it. From Wilmington, a group of us just hired a taxi to drive back to Washington. The trains were shut down. That's incredible. And then uh, I know you, you go into the book how Attor then Attorney General Ashcroft got you involved. So, so give me the time on this. This 9/11. Then Congress creates the 9/11 Victims Compensation Fund, and then you're called into the process about when? A couple weeks later. Six to eight weeks later. The 9/11 Victim Compensation Fund was created by Congress 11 days after 9/11, and within a period of six to eight weeks, I was retained by uh, the United States by Attorney General Ashcroft to design and administer the program. And. I think in the book what you convey really quite well is that people were, were well first off there was a couple of things, they, you know from an insurance perspective the airlines were capped out their liability, their insurance policy up to six billion. That's correct. So the concern of course in Congress and elsewhere was well six billion going to cover it, um, but I think the other thing that was interesting is that you really, not you personally, but the Congress basically uh, had a, a, an open-ended checkbook. There was not a, a, a set uh, That's dollar. right, there was no appropriated amount of funds. Right. Congress, uncertain of how much money would be needed to convince people not to sue, right. left it open-ended and delegated that unfettered discretion, largely, to me to design and administer a program. The goal being, how do we attract, entice people, the dead, the injured, families of the uh, dead, not to litigate against the airlines, but instead, come into this fund, waive their right to sue, and take the money. And if, if I remember correctly, the number was something like 94, 95 percent opted into this. 98 percent. 98 percent. Okay, so uh, this was a, a big success. And um, I think some of the more heartfelt passages is the, the, not the 900, I believe, uh, some odd people opted into the, the personal meetings with you. I mean, for three years, you're living and breathing this. This had to be unbelievably yeah, taxing on you. It was unbelievably stressful. We, we felt it important to give any individual claimant who wanted the opportunity to come and see me to do so. You didn't have to. Half the people wanted nothing to do with the hearings, but the other half wanted to come in and they rarely talked about money. They came to sort of vent about life's unfairness and validate the memory of a lost loved one. And then there was one anecdote there, I'm sure a lot of the media is picking up on it, uh, some family secrets spilled out, there was one in particular that comes to mind, uh, well go ahead, why don't you, you share it? No, one, one woman came to see me and, and was in, in, in sobbing about how her husband had died and he was missed a mom and had been home and she said she'd never be the same and the next day a lawyer called me and said she doesn't know that her husband has two other children by his uh, girlfriend in Queens. Mm -hmm. We had to decide whether to tell her about this. We didn't tell her. We cut two checks. And, no. and I'm going to leave 9-11 in a second, but uh, one thing that struck me is you said you didn't think that the federal government should ever wade into this type of scenario again. Uh, you, still, you still believe that? I believe that. I have two problems with 9-11. I think it worked. It was right. very successful. It was the right thing to do at the time. But bad things happen to good people every day in this country, and there's not public taxpayer money. Right. To, re, to compensate. There was no 9-11 fund for Oklahoma City. There was no 9-11 fund for Hurricane Katrina victims. So there's a philosophic problem I've got with, uh, with uh, uh, 
singling out for special treatment just some people. The other problem, of course, is in the 9-11 fund, everybody got a different amount of money in order to attract people out of the litigation system. Well, um, you know, everybody counts other people's money. You learn that in this, what I do. Everybody counts other people's money, and it, it promotes tremendous uh, animosity and uh, divisiveness among the very people you're trying to help. So if you're going to do it again, Congress, give everybody a flat amount like we did in Virginia Tech right. and let them uh, walk away uh, without waiving their right to sue. All right. Well, I'm going to leave 9-11 now. We're going to go to the Gulf Coast Claims Facility, more recent uh, headlines. So now you uh, are nationally known, I guess, uh, how, do you, how do you get involved with this now? You have the Deepwater Horizon in April 2010. I know you mentioned the Obama administration was looking for a way out of it. Uh, BP had said that they would uh, they would uh, fund all legitimate claims, but uh, walk our viewers through how did you get involved with BP uh, situation? Unlike 9/11, which was a statute, BP was a private deal, a handshake between the president and BP to front 20 billion and pay all legitimate claims. I got a call from one of BP's outside lawyers saying, you know. We're thinking about setting up a 9-11 type alternative mm -hmm. to litigation. Would you be interested? I said, well, you got to check with the Obama administration and make sure they'd be interested in having me do this, and they were. And so BP took the initiative, the administration supported it, and I was asked to design, implement, and administer the Gulf Coast Claims Facility, which we did. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, different from 9-11, we had 11 fatalities in the Deepwater Horizon blast. But most of the Gulf Coast Claims Facility was really economical. It's people who had depended on the, the Gulf. Uh, some of them, I mean, I'm in the insurance business, some of the claims were, were less than compelling. Uh, and well, why don't you talk a little bit about this? I, I know you got a little bit of heat because you were seen sometimes as being too close to BP wrongfully, right? I, I can understand that criticism. BP was paying the freight for the right. entire program. But, but the statistics, as you point out, I know it's sort of interesting. We received in 18 months a million two hundred thousand claims, almost all for economic injury, from 50 states and 35 foreign countries. When BP announced 20 billion, come one, come all, build it, and they will come, and we received, I think, something like 400 claims from New York. 400 in Massachusetts, 50 from Alaska, Sweden, Norway. We received claims from all over the world uh, in an effort to get part of that $20 billion. So, well, we're here in New York. I mean, so one of the claims, I guess, uh, I have no inside information, but might be a restaurant, uh, seafood, uh, I depend on the Gulf uh, for my shrimp. I mean, this, these are the kind of claims. Sure. Right. I lost, I'm a restaurant. Uh, we have the best shrimp scampi in New York. We lost uh, the Gulf shrimp. Our clientele know the difference, and we lost 12% of our revenues, pay me. Okay. Well, of course, we didn't pay that claim, but um, let's just say very creative claims came okay. out the door. Okay. Um, the, the other thing, just uh, we're going to leave the uh, BP Hospital in a second, but you do talk a little bit about uh, some of the political figures, some elected in office, some of them were supportive, some of them were not so supportive, but on the whole, they were generally supportive, those U.S. Senators, Governors, uh, I know Governor Barber comes out looking quite uh, well in your book, but uh, talk a little bit about uh, who, was, who was supportive, who was not supportive. Perfectly understandable. I mean, this is a freebie for elected officials. You've got your constituents. They're clamoring for money. They all claim injury. And you're their elected representative. So, so I understood this, Senator Bitter, Senator Wicker, Senator Cochran. Uh, Senator Landrew in Louisiana, Governor Haley Barber in Mississippi, Governor Scott in Florida, the Gulf elected officials, and then you have your local mayors right. in Alabama and Louisiana, county parishes, everybody clamoring. BP promised to make our people whole. Pay them, pay them, pay them. And in 18 months, we paid out almost six and a half billion dollars. And, uh, you know, Elected officials said, yeah, well, you have 20 billion. Okay. Where's the other 12, 13, 14 billion? Why haven't you paid it all out? 
So it goes with the territory, I understood that. And it was uh, compounded by the fact that BP was paying the freight. Right. BP was paying all of the claims. BP was paying all of the infrastructure. We had about 3,500 people working on this. Mm -hmm. And BP was paying my, my right. uh, administration fees. So naturally, he's, you know, he's in BP's back pocket. There's a conflict of interest. How can he be neutral when BP is paying him? And I used to say, well, who else is going to pay me? You can't ask the victims to pay, or the government, they're not going to pay. And that's what's the problem. True. The perfect storm. And the, the last item I want to get to, I know you uh, cover a lot of territory, but, and I'm not doing this in chronological order, but the, you got involved in the TARP and setting senior executive pay. I'll tell you, the one thing I was struck by is how the senior executives, how their, their self-worth was basically tied up in their paycheck, that they, uh, to a surprising degree, uh, uh, I don't know, they were almost like Major League Baseball players in the sense that, uh, you know, if I'm making five million, but that guy is hitting lower than me is making uh, more than I am, that five million is just not going to cut the mustard. If there's one thing where an insurance background would have proven valuable for me, it was in dealing with corporate executives, where every executive feels that compensation is a reflection, a mirror of their self-worth mm -hmm. in the community, in their family, among their colleagues. So when you try and explain to these corporate executives, uh, they, uh, you will be paid based on the statute in a principled way, mm -hmm. their reaction is just pay me what I'm making or what I ought to make. I mean, uh, my next door neighbor's making this, my colleagues in the office are making this. Why are you demeaning me mm -hmm. for not paying me top dollar uh, never mind what the language says, never mind what the statute says, never mind what my contract says. Right. Uh, pay me, pay me, pay me. And yet when all it was said and done, you come out with the 175 positions that you were uh, to set the pay on, and it was the public reaction was, it was muted. It, right? That's a fair assessment, right? I would have thought that whichever way I went on corporate pay, if I would be vilified, I thought that Red state Republicans would say I'm, I'm beating up on Wall Street. Mm -hmm. I thought that blue state Democrats would say you didn't take enough out of their pay, you should have reduced it even further. Mm -hmm. There were only 175 people. I mean, it was sort of a popular sideshow that I was engaged in by Congress. And so I think for the most part, the American people, oh, there's only 175 people, he's doing, you know, he's, he's doing what he has to do under the statute. Mm -hmm. It was largely uh, accepted. Okay. Well, uh, Kenneth, it's been great talking with you here. Uh, for those of you out there want to pick up the book, Who Gets What? A lot of recent American history uh, uh, is in here, and uh, certainly a great read, and thanks very much for being with us. Thank you very much. Okay. Glad to be here.